Joining us today is Carter Cornick. He is the Government Relations and Strategic and Crisis Communications Director for Arnold Golden Gregory, a law firm based in Atlanta and Washington, D.C. He is also the former Chief of Staff to the last Republican, last Republican Senator from Virginia, John Warner, and was the Press Secretary for D. French Slaughter Jr. of the 7th District of Virginia at the time, including Culpepper. Uh, Mr. Cornick, welcome. Thank you very much. Good to be with you all. <laughs> Good to be with you too. So, um, so John Warner, I mean, also D. French Slaughter Jr. These are, these are names that are ingrained in Virginia politics, but particularly John Warner, is a revered senator who you say in the same breath as as the Feinsteins and the and the McCain's, you know, of 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 the Senate, lions of the Senate, the Kennedys. Um, my first question includes him because yeah. it includes the presidency, the Senate, and the House races that happen here in Virginia. Uh, he has endorsed since two thousand fourteen three times as many Democrats for federal office as Republicans, members of his own party. Um, he's always been an independent thinker. Nobody can question that. Uh, but what does it say about how he views his party that he's moved away and started approving of Democrats rather than two of uh, the candidates who have run for his own seat? Well, it, it's a good question. Um... There was a time I worked with uh, Senator Warner in two stretches. Um, first, about five and a half years as his communications director um, for Virginia, but also for the Senate Armed Services Committee. And then um, uh, I returned to work with him to serve as his chief of staff in the first tour of duty with the senator, I would say it was 1997 to 2002, uh, October of 2002. And then uh, I came back in, um, I think it was April of uh, 2007. And um, that was to serve as chief of staff. And, um, uh, at the time, the question was um, making the decision about running for a sixth term in the United States Senate. And uh, as you'll recall, it was, I believe, 2016 that, um, hang on, we have to hit the pause button. Have to hit the pause button here. Pick up again. Mm -hmm. Go. At the time in uh, 2006, the um, George Allen was uh, running against uh, Senator Jim Webb, and um, Senator Webb won that election, which put some substantial question, um, there was great concern that the senator continue for a sixth term. Um, anyway, one of the things the senator always told me, and this goes back to the 90s, he told me that we always have three priorities, and they are in this order the Constitution of the United States, that's number one. Number two is Virginia. And then if we have any time left over, maybe there'll be some time for politics. But before we were to take any actions on those lines, we'd all talk about it first. Um, the Senator has always held the view country and Virginia and in his judgment the character and the 
quality of candidates may be with um, another party. And in his judgment, because the priority has to be the United States and Virginia in that order, um, he's never been afraid to um, step forward. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about um, a person like uh, a former candidate Oliver North or um, uh, Hillary Clinton versus uh, the current executive or um, Senator Mark Warner against the candidate this year, this cycle. Um, in, I think it was 2014, uh, the Senator did endorse um, Mark Warner. And that was not easy. Um, he has great respect for um, Ed Gillespie. Uh, he, Ed Gillespie was, it, it played enormous roles for not just um, President uh, George W. Bush for the Republican National Party, the RNC, um, but also uh, within Virginia. Ed is a tremendous man and human being. Um, the senator felt at that time that um, in particular, Virginia's congressional delegation had uh, sustained a great deal of turnover. Among the things that had been critically important in his mind, the, when he joined the Virginia congressional delegation in 1978, they all worked together, Republican and Democrat, to offset the um, uh, remarkable power that other state delegations had within the Congress. So with the Armed Services Committee, with the Appropriations Committee, the way to uh, do the best work for not just the country, but also for the Commonwealth was to look at a very big picture and would the Commonwealth be better served with some tenure, with some experience? Um, we had lost uh, a great number of members of the House to um, uh, retirement, to um, uh, uh, age, and we had lost in the Senate um, some tenure. And uh, it was his view at the time that uh, the priority of doing right and best by Virginia, as hard as the decision was, um, it was uh, his view then. And I'll say this, one of the things that's also relevant, uh, Senator Warner in 1999, the Senator John McCain, among the people that he was closest to over decades, um, came to ask him if he would be willing to support a presidential run. And he told him that he would love to do that, but it would not be until um, 2008 that he was able to do that because he um, had made a long-standing promise to the Bush family back in 1978 that he would back H.W. Bush. It was, um, I think John Warner was the first Republican senator to back uh, President Bush in 1979, um, 
against Ronald Reagan. And uh, for the senator, um, he has uh, always loved the party and always will. But the party has never taken uh, a position in his mind that exceeds the best interests of the country or the best interests of the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I'd, I'd like to stay on this subject, which is kind of the, the, the allegiance to yeah. country and, and to Commonwealth. Uh, he, he did end up endorsing John McCain in 2008, whose entire campaign was based on the motto country first. Yes. Uh, something that I would say is very markedly different than America yes. first. But, but country first. And, you know, since then, Virginia has, has gone for Democrats pretty consistently. Yeah. Um, but in 2013, when it seemed like, uh, like then Lieutenant Governor uh, Bill Bowling was going to ascend to the governorship, um, yeah. Ken Cuccinelli and, and Bowling um went into a and lieutenant governor bowling uh went into what i would say is a pretty contentious primary yes and the party in favor of keeping some amount of unity and maintaining some amount of uh some some amount doing as much damage control as possible for a situation that would have otherwise been a a, a very bloody mess for a party, mm -hmm. seeing an attorney general and a lieutenant governor, you know, going after each other, switched from a primary to a convention system. It was yeah. a move that uh, Lieutenant Governor Bowling himself called unprecedented and unfair. Um, and Republicans have bemoaned, some Republicans have bemoaned that change for the entire time since because it's given more way for extreme candidates yes um uh, now uh, this is a kind of a tough question but it's yeah. i i believe an important one do you and importantly as well does john warner believe that john warner could survive the current convention system that virginia's republican party has adopted yeah <laughs> you know Oh, boy. I'm so sorry. Can we hit the pause button here? Um, I... So do you believe that, do you believe that John Warner, but also importantly, does John Warner believe that John Warner could win in a convention style primary like the Republican Party has adopted in the last seven years? You know, it's a... Uh... It's an interesting thought. It's an interesting question. I personally would say that he would have no hesitation um, saying that um, no, no, um, because the Republican Party today in Virginia, it's a very different party than it was in the 1970s, in the 1980s, even in the 1990s. Um, you made a very important point in talking about the uh, state party decision over uh, certainly the last 10 years to um, use conventions as its primary means of selecting a Republican. Um, the very first nomination for the United States Senate that the senator uh, sought was convention. And it came down to ultimately from four candidates uh, to two. Um, he lost that uh, convention nomination. Um, 
it turned out that two months later, the party came back to ask him to take it when um, the nominee perished in a plane crash. Um, the senator, when his last, in 2006, he chose, I believe, uh, former Governor Jim Gilmore was the Attorney General at the time of Virginia. He chose a primary for the nomination process in Virginia. There was a great effort to compel a convention that would select the nominee. Um, because the party rules and Virginia law were the way they were, the incumbent held the privilege of choosing the method of nomination. Um, the senator very purposely chose primary. And it was the case that Jim Miller was um, uh, defeated in a convincing fashion. Mark Warner at the time would comment that the whole reason he determined to run for the United States Senate in 1996 was because the senator had to spend millions to um, become the nominee of the Republican Party. Um, if he were to be in a circumstance, these in, in the uh, uh, 21st century as, as we are right now, I think that uh, he would uh, very likely say, no, I would not be successful in these circumstances um, because the point is fealty to a, uh, a set of priorities that um, may or may not generate from Virginia or from um, with the uh, Constitution as the first and foremost uh, uh, priority. Um, I would also point out that probably the last Republican to win statewide, it's been at least 10 years. I don't know whether it was 2008 or 2009, statewide, um, Virginia Republicans have not been able to win, whether it was Ed Gillespie, whether it was Ken Cuccinelli. Um, I mean, there are a long list of candidates. Uh, Corey Stewart comes to mind. The convention process has, it cannot claim success in selecting a nominee that enjoys uh, statewide approval. And um, I think uh, it's just a point that's worth thinking through. So, um, so I, I kind of want to move towards, um, towards that as well, uh, but also veering off into general Virginia politics. Virginia for, I want, how many races is that between, between Lyndon Johnson and, and, and Barack Obama? I mean, between, a lot. between 1968 and 2008, that is 40 yep. years of Republicans being elected in Virginia. Um, for over a decade now, it's flipped the entirely opposite direction. 
Yes. And only Democrats are elected for the most part to statewide office, to, um, uh, to federal office as well, with yes. possibly the, the exception of Kirk Cox, the, the, former, um, the former House Speaker of the House of Delegates. Mm-hmm. Um, as a native Virginian, because you are yeah. from Alexandria and you live in Alexandria and you grew up in Alexandria and you went to the University of Virginia, what movement, movements do you see within the Commonwealth's politics uh, from your young age to your current yeah. somehow even younger age? Yeah, a lot has changed. Um, I think the biggest things are Virginia now has um, enormous uh, metropolitan areas. Uh, For example, the uh, Northern Virginia area has seen extraordinary growth. When, when you look, most people think in terms of, uh, I don't know, Fairfax County or Arlington and the population explosion and whatnot, but you can see it uh, in places like uh, Leesburg, Virginia, Loudoun County. When um, I was first uh, driving through um, Leesburg, they had one high school and a few secondary and elementary schools. Um, They have, their growth has been exponential over many, many years. Uh, In the uh, Tidewater area, in uh, Norfolk, uh, Newport News, Virginia Beach, a similar explosion uh, in terms of population. The uh, the Commonwealth has grown and changed a lot. Its economy is not um, uh, tobacco, peanuts, agriculture. Um, it is. It, 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 it. There was a tremendous textile um, uh, base and industry. Um, it changes all through the 1980s, the 1990s have changed the demographics of the state dramatically. And all of these things have made a big difference. When you see any kind of um, election night map, you'll see Virginia as a sea of red, except for these pockets of blue. And then the issue is how many people live in those pockets. And uh, what you find is that um, uh, a candidate like Mark Warner, his uh, greatest strengths are in the suburban and um, uh, more heavily populated regions of the state. Um, I think these things have played a big big role. Among the things that successful candidates have done, regardless of time and place, is find ways to build coalitions. People from different backgrounds with different perspectives who are willing to find or coalesce around a broader common ground. A lot of people uh, prefer to look at that as um, uh, compromise in a negative kind of way or tend to look at that as uh, um, a quaint memory of times that were long ago. But among the things that has been critical I would argue that the founding of the country was built on providing rights and privileges to the minority. And the point was always that there would have to be consensus arrived at. And that requires people 
from different backgrounds with different interests finding a way to agree on some core interests. Um, candidates that win statewide are those that are bigger than a single ideology or a single issue. The state has um, a tremendous diversity. It's not just women, it's not just gender or ethnicity or age. The Commonwealth is a very um, dynamic place. And um, what I believe is that the Democratic Party has been able to demonstrate a um, interest in perspectives in a way that the Republican uh, Party has simply not, at least over the last 10, I would argue 20 years. Um, and so I would suggest, and I, I, I don't know if we should just categorize this as just one opinion, but um, I think that until the Republican Party is able to recognize there is value and strength in um, working across party lines, in working across jurisdictional lines, they're going to continue to find a difficulty in earning the confidence of a majority of Virginians to hold statewide office. Um, I would say that those are at least some of the reasons that come to my mind over what has um, evolved and emerged. Um, we have uh, lost um, some very good legislators uh, because they um, were, uh, I guess, deemed not to be um, sufficiently um, committed to a particular uh, point of view. And um, uh, there are just consequences to that. Uh, so coming up to what will tomorrow night be uh, a very important issue. Uh, and it, it's somewhat unrelated, but it's equally very important. We don't have candidates. We don't just have candidates on the ballot. Right. We have issues on the ballot as well. We have two amendments coming up. The, the first one, a redistricting amendment, which has been uh, argued here in Virginia since 2014. Uh, yeah. And one of the two of the big proponents are uh, our state secretary of transportation valentine and former uh, lieutenant governor bowling himself uh who started one virginia 2021 yeah uh we've reached the number of signatures that are necessary and we've uh seen supporting legislation go through the house of delegates but in in what's a very apparent flip-flop by Democrats who supported supporting legislation for uh, fair and nonpartisan uh, uh, redistricting here in Virginia last year, uh, they are campaigning pretty actively against the Amendment 1 measure this year. Yes. Uh, some yeah. claiming that it was because they didn't have enough time to read the supporting legislation, others claiming that it was for other reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, Democrats had 27 years in the minority to yes. make this an issue and to say, we want fair redistricting because we're the minority party, or we want fair redistricting because Virginians need representation, which is obviously the better argument out of those two, rather than yeah. the party making it about the Commonwealth. But what, what's the best path forward for Amendment 1 this election day in an election that has 
very clearly had the waters muddied about this amendment. Well, I'll say this. Um, I personally supported Amendment 1. And um, among the reasons is that um, I am certain that the current process by which redistricting occurs has proven that we are going to continuously have to deal with raw political interest over and over again. Keep in mind, Virginia is among that select few that continues to require approval from the Department of Justice for any redistricting plan. And that the history that goes with that is um, long, long and deep. Um, it is the case that regardless of whether it was Democrats in power or Republicans in power, each party has uh, used the process to grow its power, to grow its majorities. And I would even argue that there has been a collaborative part of this process where the interests of both have been served when it comes to preserving certain um, kinds of districts. There are a bunch of reasons those things happen, but I think that when the point of redistricting ultimately boils down to preserving incumbency or extending the authority of one party, the, the, the raw numbers of one party at the expense of another, what ultimately ends up being the case is that individual members running in those districts are running and um, making their case to people who look like them, sound like them, believe like them. There is no point in um, reaching across any aisle for any reason, the only point is to determine, are you faithful enough? Incumbents generally don't lose to another party. They generally lose to their own who determine them not to be, let's just say, conservative enough. And what that does is it reinforces extremes. There is no reason to build coalitions when all those do is um, uh, accentuate the, um, the strength of the uh, uh, single issue folk who will defeat you. Your only, your best prospect of continuing service is to um, be as dedicated and committed to the particular issue, cause, or philosophy. And in the end, that does not give people any kind of incentive to find common ground. If districts are drawn in such a way that they have locality, neighborhoods, um, 
and all of the different elements of those communities are included in the um, uh, representative entity that compels the uh, candidates to show breadth and to show um, uh, an ability to build coalitions, to build bridges, to find common ground. So in my opinion, anything that Virginia can do to make the process less partisan, less like it is, is valuable. And I understand from the perspective of the Democrat Party, it is enormously convenient that at the very moment that the Republican Party is losing its grip, losing its ability to command and control the redistricting process, they find it uh, important to be um, a partisan, a political, and to have a commission, a bipartisan commission along the lines that has been established. I can perfectly understand why there would be a reluctance at the very moment that you could, for a, a decade, um, build the numbers you need to effectuate the course correction that you're on. But um, if we hold the view that the purpose of elected office is to serve, and we hold the view that the Commonwealth interest has to take a priority over uh, local community or um, lesser interests, then if not now, I don't know when. And um, I, I uh, am less, I have a great understanding and um, sympathy for the conflict that some have on this. Um, but I do believe that the, um, the Commonwealth is going to be much better served more people are going to be required to, uh, instead of run in districts that look like them, sound like them, um, uh, effectively mirrors of a single view or a single perspective, uh, it's important that we are all compelling each other to um, get beyond our own interests or our own knowledge and um, work with a bigger uh, collective so that we can um, do uh, better work, I believe. Um, and, and I'll say this, I've I've been a Republican my entire life, um, and I have benefited from the uh, gerrymandering system. Um, somewhere along the line, um, everyone needs to uh, ask whether what we're doing is working, and if we are not satisfied that the result of years and years of doing things the same way um, is working, then eventually somewhere along the line, we have to try something different. And um, I think everybody from the Virginia One group to um, the Democratic Party to the Republicans, all agree that this is far from perfect, but you can't, somewhere along the line, different, at least in the direction of bipartisan, I think it's worth a shot. 
Um, so I, I've invoked him a fair amount tonight. Uh, I, I think he deserves a, another mention. Uh, your former boss, uh, John Warner, how, how is he doing? How has he oh. been? Uh, he, uh, you know. I'm so glad. Thank you for asking. Um, the senator is, um, he is hale and hearty. He is um, as uh, irascible as he has always been. He is um, kicking up a lot of dust whenever and wherever. Obviously, most recently has uh, disappointed a number of his Republican friends by um, continuing his uh, longstanding support of Mark Warner. Um, he uh, proudly uh, supports the uh, senator and um, admires beyond words the service and um, the candidacy of uh, 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 Republican Gage. Um, he has enormous respect for him. Um, uh, by the same token, uh, the senator just, um, he has always been uh, committed to uh, what he believes is right to Virginia. This is, uh, for him, it really is, um, he just can't help uh, being um, contrarian in uh, all the ways he was just born that way. Um, but he is well, he is uh, uh, with his wife, uh, Jeannie, in Alexandria and um, getting together with uh, folks on a regular basis. Uh, I will tell you, he's not, um, uh, swimming as much as he used to, or um, hitting the links, the the golf, something he loved uh, so much, but um, he does uh, continue to uh, do a whole bunch, uh, whether it's gardening or painting or um, uh, calling up folks at the Defense Department to make sure they haven't lost their minds. He's uh, he's something else. Thank you for asking. A wonderful gentleman and um, uh, all a real ahead. maverick. <laughs> he used to say, "All ahead, one third." Yes, sir. Well, we wish you and him the best. Uh, okay. We will see tomorrow exactly yeah. where this race goes, and uh, and and how it fares for those who he has endorsed. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but, I. Um, I know that uh, tonight is a big one, and um, obviously uh, the day after an election is always big too, <laughs> because people have to figure out what in the heck, but um, it's, uh, it's a tremendous day. This exercise in um, uh, our, the Senator used to always say, this experiment in self-governance is the most important thing in the world um, to nations, others all around the world that we carry forward and um, express ourselves uh, under the Constitution. We do have a supreme law and um, we're going to all do our best to uh, keep this ship on course. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cornick, for joining us. And, uh, and, and, and we, uh, we definitely hope to hear from you again. Oh, thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. Take care. You too.